Okay, so uh, when you're talking about distributed systems, initially we talked about uh, compute. Uh, the next topic is storage. So today we have uh, Quentin OK, who's the CTO of Infinite. They're building a distributed storage platform, and he's going to talk to us about uh, uh, their persistent storage uh, platform tailored for containers. Thank you. So. Hi everyone, it's very nice being here, so thanks Docker for the invitation. Uh, I'm Quentin, I'm CTO at Infinite, and I'm going to talk about persistent storage tailored specifically for containers and to present the uh, storage platform we develop at Infinite. So first I'll talk a bit about containers and why they need persistent storage and what properties we should expect from that storage. I will present the big picture of our uh, storage platform we will dive in a bit into technical details and see what design choices we made to develop our platform. Then I'll do a quick demo to give you a grasp of how it all works. And finally, we'll have a question and answer session. So containers, I guess we all love containers here. Why do we love them? I would say that containers are um, fast, scalable, and flexible. Contain containers are really fast and easy to stop and start. You can move them around very easily. They are very easy to scale. Once your application is running in one container, it's trivial to scale horizontally by spawning other similar containers. They give you a unified environment from development to production, yet you can run them on different kinds of infrastructure, different machines, different set of networks, size of networks, to uh, make them suited for any situation from development to production. However, um, containers tend to be stateless by design because they always start from scratch. However, most software applications are not stateless, so we need some sort of persistent storage for our containers to hold the state of our application. But that storage system should not take away from us the benefits from containers. So this system should be able to be created and started as easily as a container because if it's really easy to start your application in a matter of seconds, but your application needs uh, a storage system that's long to configure and takes long to start, well, you just lost all the benefits from using a container. Likewise, your storage system should be trivial to scale horizontally, otherwise it becomes your new bottleneck and there's no point. Likewise, it should provide you with the same API from development to production, so your application does not have to change depending on the situation, but it should be configurable enough to be performant on when developing on your desktop and performant in production in the cloud. So with that in mind, we developed the Infinite Storage Platform. How the big idea is that it's going to aggregate all the local storage of your nodes right here with a lot of different uh, properties that you, that you can enable or disable. And on top of that, we will provide a few APIs. For instance, we have a file system API, so you can get a POSIX moon point where you can that is just shared between all your containers. We provide an object storage interface compatible, for instance, with S3, or we provide a block uh, storage interface that you can format with your own file system. How does this all work? Well, the main idea behind the, um, the Infinite platform is that it is truly distributed. Mean completely decentralized, meaning, meaning that there is no node in the system that is specific. All nodes are just member. There is not any specific node in there. Thanks to this, Infinite works exactly the same with one node or 10,000 nodes. And nodes can come and go at will. You, you never have to worry about pulling a node out of the system because there's no specific node. So you're not pulling out a crucial node in the system. You can also very easily add new nodes because, well, they just become new members. So thanks to this, we've made uh, infinite uh, in accordance to the uh, containers properties I was talking about before. Because infinite can be created and run extremely easily. You can spin up a new infinite storage system with every new container you create. It is not going to slow you down. Because we can very easily add and remove node, it's trivial to scale infinite with your uh, containers pool. Infinite provides you with the same API, be it file system, object, or block all along the process, but it is highly configurable so it can get the best out of the current infrastructure. It works very fast on your laptop and it will use you, your cloud production at best. The different uh, main 
founding bricks of, of infinite are the following ones. First of all, we take all your nodes and we federate them into an overlay network. When I say overlay network here, I'm not talking about the same kind of overlay network that we're talking uh, at Docker or on it networking, where it pretty much is a network encap encapsulated inside another network. For us, an overlay network is a family of algorithms that enable you to bring together thousands of nodes, ten of thousands, and make them able to route to each other and discover what nodes hold what chunk of data. So once we've reunited all those nodes inside an overlay network, on top of that, we build a distributed hash table that is pretty much a key value store that will distribute the block it stores inside the whole network. And for each block, we run a specific consensus, since there is one consensus algorithm per block. Those blocks, they use cryptographical access control, meaning that whenever you write a block, the block is self-contained, it is self-certified, it holds some kind of signature, so other nodes can check that you indeed had the permission to write that block. Likewise, the payload of every block is ciphered, so if someone is supposed to have read access to that block, he will technically be able to decipher the content of the block, and vice versa. Thanks to this, you never have to ask any other node whether someone is allowed to write or read a block. Every block is self-contained, so you do not need any kind of authority or any kind of leader. And thanks to this too, we um, design a system that is symmetrical. All operations are, are symmetric, meaning that any node can replay any operation. If a node, even if the node that was the original author of the uh, operation is now gone, it crashed, other nodes can just keep propagating that modification to other nodes. So this gives us great flexibility and uh, great resilience. Now for a more graphical view of how it all works. So say I have uh, three infinite nodes. One, two, and three. Uh, device one is going to be uh, a client, device three is going to be just a server, and device two is going to have both. It will be able to store block and will provide access to the storage through the file system API. Say I am on device one, I have uh, the storage mounted as a file system, and I want to create a file in there. So here at step one, all I have are file system operations, pretty much syscalls. The first layer, the file system layer here, its role is to um, translate file system operations into block operations, something that can be understood by the distributed hash table. So for instance, if creating a file, as you might guess, is going to mean creating a, creating a few new blocks to store the file content, and probably updating a block, the block that represents the directory, to insert the new file in there. Anyway, here at step two, I now have operations on blocks. Let's focus on the operations that will update the directory to add the new file. What's going to happen then is the DHT is going to ask my overlay network what nodes in the system hold that block that represents the directory. At step four here, the overlay which run will run its own algorithm to determine what node in the system holds that block, is responsible for that block, and return to the DHT the list of nodes that hold the block and how to contact them. With this knowledge, at step five here, the DHT will connect to those nodes and run a consensus algorithm to uh, negotiate the new value of the block. And when all the DHT nodes agree uh, with the um, new value of the block, they will all locally store the new block in their local storage. That's pretty much how operations work in uh, the infinite file system. But now let's dive in a bit into technical details because that's what we are here for, I guess. First, I would like to dive in a bit into the DHT. So as I said, the DHT is pretty much just a key value store. You have a bunch of addresses, and at some addresses you find a block, a block being pretty much just an arbitrary payload. We use um, many kinds of different blocks to store our data in the DHT, but I would like to focus on two main categories of blocks. The first one being mutable blocks. As the name suggests, it's a block whose payload can change over time, what is that you can edit. So these blocks, they are quite costly because they are subject to conflicts. If I am able to update the value insti inside a block, well, it's probable that other nodes in the network I are able to do so. And if we do so at the same time, we might end up with a conflict. So when, when writing to those blocks, we have to run some kind of consensus. Also, they are subject to invalidation. When I download what, uh, one of those blocks, I cannot hold to it for too long because it may change. So next time I want to use it, I have to check if there's been a new version. And because of that also, 
even if I ask a fetch that block from a peer and it gives me a valid answer, I cannot be sure it's the latest version because maybe that peer did not know about the latest version. So even when reading those blocks, I have to run some kind of consensus algorithm to make sure I actually get the latest version of the block. And finally, those blocks and they can be quite hard to certify and to cipher because well, you cipher the content with uh, making it uh, ma so only the people supposed to be able to read it might read it, but someone might add read permission or remove read permission. So you have it can get quite tricky. There's work to be done there. So mutable blocks, quite complex. Now the second category of blocks, as you might have guessed, would be immutable blocks. Immutable blocks are awesome because, well, they are not subject to conflicts. There's only one version, so no conflicts there. They are not subject to invalidation. If you fetch it and it's valid, you know it's the latest version because there's only one version. Nothing to do there. And they are quite easy to certify and to cipher because we make them what we call content addressable, meaning that the address of an immutable block is just the hash of the content. This works because the contents never changes, so the address never changes. So whenever you fetch one of those blocks, all you have to do is hash the content, check that this matches the address, and you know that the block is valid and is indeed the one you were looking for. All of this makes immutable block extremely cheap to write and read. When you write one, all you have to do is upload it to the, no to the node supposed to store it. You do not need to negotiate anything, there's no conflict. Same when you read it, you can just fetch it once and you know it's valid. It also makes them uh, fetchable from any source. For instance, if you have another client in your room, is in your local network that happen to have that immutable block, you can fetch it from your neighbor. You don't even have to ask the actual server that store it because it's always going to be valid. It's going to be always going to be the latest version. You can be opportunistic on reads on immutable blocks. And finally, but not least, they are cacheable permanently. Anytime you fetch an immutable block, you can decide to store it locally, to cache it, it will, it will always be valid. So when we design uh, on top of the DHT, we try to um, use as many immutable blocks as possible and limit the number of mutable blocks. So speaking about that, let's dive in a bit on the file system layer. So the layer that translate file system entities into blocks. For instance, how do we represent a file in our system? Well, the file would mostly be one single immutable block that will be the inode for the file, and that block holds all the metadata, modification time, change time, number of links, and a FAT, a file allocation table, that is just a list of addresses to immutable blocks. And those immutable blocks actually hold the content of the file, split in chunks. So thanks to this, it makes file contents cacheable at will, because remember, those are immutable, so the actual content of the file you can keep forever. It will never be invalidated. So when you read the file, all you have to do is fetch the inode, and if it has not changed, you probably already have all the data on disk locally, if you read it a lot. So that makes them highly cacheable, highly fast to read. I it also makes them uh, very cheap to write, because when you write a file, most of the grunt work is uploading the content of the file. But that is just immutable blocks. So as we said earlier, it's really fast and easy to upload to nodes. And when you are done uploading your immutable blocks that are the content of the file, all you need to do is one single mutable uh, update to the inode. So you only pay once for the costly operation. And this also gives us atomic file rights, because if you update a file, while you are pushing the immutable blocks into the system, you did not update the file yet. It's only when you actually commit to the inode with the new FAT, the new list of mutable, immutable blocks, that you will uh, make the uh, actual change. So this is an, uh, an atomic operation. And thanks to this trick, that is sort of similar to the uh, tricks on radic trees to make uh, atomic updates, um, we get uh, atomic uh, atomicity at the syscall level in our file system. All the syscalls are transactional. It's all or nothing. Uh, more on the um, file system layer. Um, so it's the POSIX PFS API. Uh, the problem with uh, this API is that it's inherently sequential, and all most applications will use it sequentially. For instance, if you run ls in your terminal, what's going to happen in terms of syscalls, you will first get an open dir, so our DHT will look up for the block that represents the directory in the overlay, and when it gets the result, it will download that block from the right peer and send it back to ls. And when ls has this result, 
it will start the file sequentially. So for every single uh, file in the directory, we will do the same uh, round trip. So it starts the first file, so we have to look it up in the overlay, then download it from the peers, get the result back to LS, and only then LS will start doing uh, starting the next file, which is highly sub-performant for us because, well, we're going to do a lookup on the overlay of only one address every time. We're going to be one overlay query per file. But our overlay algorithms have the ability to query batches of address, which is much, much faster than individual queries. Likewise, we're going to fetch all the metadata blocks one by one sequentially. But we are in a distributed system, so we can probably multi-source them. They are all distributed across the system, so we could download all of them in parallel and greatly speed up things. So this really makes the system slow way where it should not be. So how we solve this is we implement what we call uh, directories prefetching and files look ahead. The whole idea is that when you're going to run ls, while well the beginning load file is going to be the same, open dear, so we'll look up the directory block, we fetch it. But here, as soon as we get the um, directory block back, and even before we give the answer to ls, we're going to guess a bit. We're guessing that if the application is opening a directory, there are good chances it's going to look at the metadata of the uh, files inside that directory. So what we're going to do is, right away, even before giving back the result, we're going to launch one big batch uh, lookup on the overlay with all the addresses of the metadata block inside the directory, which will be much, much faster than sending indiv individual query every time. And as soon as we start receiving answers from the overlay, we're going to start pipelining and uh, downloading all the metadata blocks in parallel. So when LS comes back with its first stat, it's going probably to take some time, like before, because we still need to get the block. But it's probable that the subsequent uh, stat will get the results directory from main memory, and it will be a matter of milliseconds. So this uh, greatly speeds up things in the file system. And a files look ahead is pretty much the same ID, but for files. Because most applications, you open a file, you read the buffer, and when you're done consuming it, you fetch the next buffer. But the idea is that uh, if you hit the end of the immutable block in our system, you're going to have to wait. So what we do is we always preload a few blocks ahead of your current uh, read point in the file to make sure that we always can provide you with some new data without having to do networks round trips. Let's talk a bit about uh, consensus now. As you may have noticed, I mentioned earlier that we run a consensus per block. Many distributed system, uh, they will use um, one consensus for the whole system. For instance here, this system is distributed because you have many nodes that are just followers, but inside that system, there are a few specific nodes. There's the main quorum, a central quorum, a few masters, and if you use RAP, there's, there's even a leader among those masters. So the problem here is that, well, first, those are um, crucial nodes. They are more specific than others. In if one gets down, well, of course, there's some redundancy. There's three of them. But you should intervene manually quite quickly to get a new one up or do something. And if the leader gets down, it's going to take some time for the system to get back up. Also, uh, you can see that it does not scale linearly. Because if you add new followers, well, there's only just three of those to handle all the consensus load from the whole system. So uh, at some point, this may, may become a bottleneck. What we do is that, as I said earlier, there, ab there is absolutely no specific node in an infinite uh, system. So all the nodes are equal. And the set of nodes that is responsible for a block will hold a specific quorum for that block just locally. And that uh, algorithm is not going to be raft, for instance, because raft re requires permanent gossip to elect a leader, so we could not re uh, run as many uh, raft algorithms as there are blocks, is going to be something based off multipaxels, because multipaxels is offline. When there's no changes, it does not require any operation. So uh, for every block in the system, there's going to be a few nodes that are responsible for that block, and they will run their own quorum. So this shows you that because there is no central uh, consensus, central quorum, there's no bottleneck, no specific point of failure, while still providing a strong read of a write consistency. Meaning in the system, once a uh, write is down, you have the absolute guarantee that any subsequent read will give you the latest version of the data. Finally, I'd like to talk a bit about the overlay layer, because it's one of the main places where you can actually configure the platform by picking the right algorithm. I said first that Infinite is able to handle 10,000, 100,000 of nodes. 
Uh, when you do so, you should probably pick an algorithm that would be Calypse, Scademlia, Cord. Those are algorithms that come from popular peer-to-peer uh, -peer software. And how they work is that, well, if there's hundred thousands of them, then there's no way I'm going to keep an open connection to everyone. And there's no way I can keep in memory a list of what nodes uh, hold what block. It just would not fit. So we can only have partial knowledge. So when you look up a block, what it's going to do, it's going to gossip around, for Calypso, for instance, with neighbors, to find out what nodes actually have that block and find out that. Um, but in many cases, you don't need that. If you think, for instance, Docker Swarm, you're probably going to have a few dozen nodes, maybe a few hundreds, and you're going to store maybe a few dozen terabytes. And if you do that, well, you can definitely keep a connection to everyone. 100 connection is not that much. And the actual whole address space does fit in main memory. So in that case, you can switch to a specific, a more specific uh, overlay implementation that when it boots up, will connect to everyone, downloads all the catalogs of other peers, and then uh, has the whole address space in main memory. So anytime you look up with that implementation, you have the result directly in memory. There is no network round trip when you look up a block. So thanks to this, you can have scalability to up of 100,000 of nodes, but you don't have to pay that price if you just have a few hundred nodes. Also, the overlay uh, is responsible for allocating where the uh, blocks are stored. So at this uh, layer, you can make your system placement aware. Like you could add policies that will ensure that no two replicas of a block are on the same rack to make sure that there is one replica in every data center. You could also, for instance, ensure that there is uh, a copy of every immutable block in each of your sites, so as clients in any site has access to local copies of immutable block, greatly, greatly speeding up reads, etc. you name it. So now for a quick demo of how this all works. I did not make a sacrifice to the demo god, so I trust him to be merciful with me especially because I'm going to use uh, infinite cluster, which is a new command we recently added, recently being uh, yesterday, um, that uses all the, uh, that sits on top of the other commands to create a very simple uh, interface to create and run an infinite cluster. Quite similar to uh, Docker Swarm in it, etc. We m might have like, taken some ideas there. So um, I'm going to run it all in containers, of course. What I'm going to do here, so I'm just going to run itrm. I'm going to name that container node one. It's going to be the first node of my cluster. And in there, I'm just going to run infinite cluster dash dash init. So it will spin up the cluster. OK, down. So the cluster is now started. So as you may know, it's extremely fast. It's already working. So you could start this with your container. It's not a problem. I'm now going to uh, connect a second node to the system. So I'm going to run pretty much the same, except I will name it node 2. I will link it with node 1 so they can communicate. And this time, I'm going to say infinite cluster join node 1. So it just connects to the first node and join its cluster. Done. It's connected to the, to the first node. So now I have a three nodes cluster. And I'm going to create a third one. So the name is node 3. It's linked to node 1 and node 2. And uh, it runs, likewise, infinite cluster join node 1. Here we go. So here I have three nodes, one, two, three, that run my infinite cluster that is distributed across three nodes. It has sensible defaults. For instance, it has a replication factor of three for every block. So every block is going to be written to all of the three nodes. Let's test it out. So I'm going to run a uh, simple uh, container just to test. It's going to be named client. I need it to be privileged because I'm going to use a mount point interface so I need to be able to mount. I will link, uh, I'm linking it to all the other three nodes. I'm just running bash in there. So all I have to do is infinite cluster. This time I'm going to say connect because I'm not joining the cluster. I'm not being a member, a server of the cluster. I'm just going to be a client. I will access it. So I'm just going to say connect to node one done. So now, whenever I'm going to issue infinite commands, it's going to be talking to that cluster that I just started uh, in the other terminals. And we, st we can start playing with it. So for instance, I'm going to create a file system in there. So to us, a file system is a volume. So I will say create and name it Docker Summit, for instance, if I can type. There's some yellow, but it's not a big deal. 
Um, so my volume is created, and now I can simply mount it. Done. So now I have my mount point mounted in my container. And to prove that to you, I'm going to put that in the background. It's here. So that is my actual network mount point that is stored on the three other devices. Let's play with it a bit. I'm going to create a few directories in there. Uh, yeah, I don't have my aliases. So here, I did create a directory in there, and it was distributed. Let's check that. I'm not actually lying. I'm going to um, enter one of the servers and check what happens there. So I'm going to enter the node one containers I started before with bash. And here, I'm going to take a look inside um, var infinite. So here, what I have is all the blocks that were created by the system. That's a bit too big, maybe. Well, you get the idea. So what we have in there is all the blocks that were actually written to that machine. And if I were to, for instance, I can count them. So I have 17 blocks. And if I were to create a new file here, say foo, probably going to see a few new blocks there. Okay, so good, I can mount my file system. But let's do even better now. Let's mount it as an actual Docker volume. So we have a binary that's infinite daemon, that does a lot of things with it, but also acts as a Docker volume plugin. Let me start it. So it's a bit more tricky. Let's run through this command line once. I'm going to name it plugin. It has to be privileged because it mounts file systems. Uh, I'm going to mount slash run into my container just because it needs to be able to talk with the Docker daemon of the host, just details. It's linked with all the other three uh, nodes. And what I do in there, yeah, just I just run infinite cluster connect to connect to my cluster, and then I, I run the infinite daemon. Connected and started. And once I've done that, magic happens. If I do docker volume ls, I have my infinite uh, volume there. And I can use it anywhere, extremely simply, with the syntax you're uh, used to. So here I'm just saying volume, infinite docker summit. So by infinite volume, I want it mounted on TMP infinite. And I run any container, say Ubuntu. And here, if I go in TMP infinite, I have the data I used before. It's all there. Let's mount it into a new container. So I have two containers mounting that volume. It's there too. Let's try uh, adding something in there. Writing something into foo and catting it from here. It's there. I can remove that file. <laughs> Disappeared. So here's the idea of how it works. And it's uh, interesting because uh, when we were seeing the, um, the infra kit schematics, you knew there, there was cattle, basically, and there were pets. And pets were pretty much stateful, and they had names that were like a bit more precious than cattle. Well, the whole idea of infinite is to make that storage not pets, but just cattle. My, just my storage nodes are just cattle. They are flexible. They can come and go. You don't need to, you don't need to care about them particularly. Just make storage. Um, like as flexible as as simple as containers. You have any questions? Yes. Thank you. So the question is: uh, You mentioned in the beginning that this will work with overlay networks. So will it not work with CNI networks? No, uh, um, yes, uh, no, I was just like, mm, I wanted to make, like when I say overlay network, I do not mean the same overlay network as Docker. That's what I meant. It's just a type of algorithm. But it, it will work with any network. Actually, we are completely agnostic with network. We just want the NAS to be rootable and to be able to connect to each other. We're just making sure that we there was were no vocabulary ambiguity. Because when I tend to use overlay network with people in networking, DevOps, and Docker, they tend to understand something else. 
And there are a couple of questions back here. So, excuse me. Hi, uh, good talk, first of all. Uh, I have a few questions, but I'm going to pick the, the ones I think are more important. Um, so if you have per block consensus only, uh, how, how do you manage concurrency at a higher level, say a uh, file level that crosses, outgrows a single block? Uh, I didn't get the end. How do you manage concurrency at a higher level than a block level, for instance, a file that outgrows a single block size? Uh, well, uh, this we only handle blocks. Everything is translated into blocks, and only blocks blocks are atomic. So we only have to handle uh, at, uh, consensus at the block level. Anything built on top of that, even the file system, the S3 storage, and uh, block device, uh, just maps into DHT blocks. So if consensus is handled by uh, per block, it's done. I'm not sure I did get your question right. So. Um, Julian's going to have a birds of a feather tomorrow as well, so uh, it sounds like you have a whole list of questions. So you should, <laughs> you should just, and we're going to start lunch in about a minute. I saw a question over here, but Julian's going to be available for lunch. There's a birds of a feather tomorrow, and uh, so you'll definitely get your, your questions answered. Thank you. Yeah, we'll was was there still a question over here? Yeah. Oh, We're going to do one more, and you can just grab Julian uh, right after this. I'm quite in. Uh, could you, uh, can you compare to IPFS briefly, at least? Um, Julian might do that better than I would, but uh, I sort of can. Um, it's on some aspect similar, except IF IPFS, as far as I know, it's still based on uh, content popularity. Uh, while we uh, have strong semantic and strong consistency, meaning that whenever you put uh, your data in, you must you must be absolutely sure that you have strong read after write consistency that is going to stay there, that is going to be available even if it is not popular. But uh, the whole idea is that uh, IPFS could we could maybe use IPFS as the overlay layer. So actually, IPFS could be one of the bricks if it could be built upon. 